Hello, everyone. Welcome to the live session of Feeding a Hungry Planet. Uh, we are here live with Ken Giller and Theresa Ampadu Boace. Um, so, where are you now, Ken and uh, Theresa? Well, great. Thanks uh, very much, Helene, for the introduction. Um, we're here actually in Oslo, and, and I'll show you in a minute. First of all, maybe I'll let uh, Theresa introduce herself to you. Yes. So, as you rightly said, my name is Theresa Ampadu Boace. Um, I work with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture based in Nigeria headquarters. Um, my profession, I'm monitoring and evaluation specialist, but the background is social scientist. So basically that's a summary about myself. So just before we start, I'm just going to show you where we are. So you can see some soils on the wall behind me. So we're in the Department of Soil Science at the University of Life Sciences in Ås near Oslo. And just to prove that we're in Norway, I hope you can all see outside, it's really very cold and snowy. So that's just to give you a bit of context. So what Teresa and I are doing here in uh, Norway for a couple of days is we're in discussions with NORAD, with the Norwegian uh, Development Agency, about uh, legumes and, and about sustainable soy production in, in Africa. So what I, we'd like to do today, though, is I'd, I'd like to talk to uh, Teresa and pose her a few questions about the work she's been doing in the past few years. So, Teresa, you've been working, well, we've been working together now for several years on this project, End to Africa. Can you explain to us, first of all, the main aims of the project? Yeah, um, End to Africa is putting nitrogen to work for the smallholder farmer basically has two components, a development component and a research component. The development component is making sure that the legume productivity is increased among the smallholder farmers, uh, making sure the incomes are improved, nutrition, and again, one key thing is resolving gender disparity using legume production. Then the research component is always making sure that the research questions emerge are addressed uh, regarding to closing the yield gap where there are issues. So that's the okay. summary. Yeah. So maybe, you know, we've got different people of different backgrounds yeah. who are following the course. So can, maybe you can explain what do we mean by grain legumes? Which crops are we talking about? Yes, basically the project is looking at six different crops or legume uh, crops. We are looking at cow peas, granules, soya beans, um, common beans, chickpea and faba bean, and these are all country specific. So depending on the country choices, we have a minimum of three of these legumes supported across the 11 countries that the project is working in. So, so why are grain legumes important for sustainable intensification? Yeah, we're talking this week, particularly in the course, about this idea of intensifying yields, you know, increasing yields sustainably. Uh, looking at the benefits that legumes really bring in, as I said initially, my background is social scientist. And then when I joined the project, I was a bit surprised to really see how all the scientists are pushing for legumes, but really looking at the benefits of these legumes and looking at the critical role of, let's say, production. So we have benefits such as nutrition, we have benefits such as that legume being able to fix nitrogen within that soil when it's depleted. Um, also feed for animal. So really it has a key role to play in terms of sustainable production. So for me, that is my response. So although you were skeptical of us agronomists in the beginning, sure. now, you're, now you're convinced. Sure. <laughs> sure. And, and why do you think legumes have got a particular important role in, in gender? I and mean, you mentioned that directly at the beginning. Yes. Um, if I select just a few of the countries that the project is working in, if I pick, for instance, Tanzania, when we started and we did a bit of survey, it's about 45% of the producers being women. If you pick um, Uganda in certain locations, it's about 55% of women. And for me, looking at the women involvement along that value chain of production, of marketing, consumption in terms of women also play a role in preparing food at the household. So also making sure this is integrated. 
uh, focusing on that crop and making sure that yes, productivity is increased, prices are good, the quality. Then for me, the issues of gender and mm -hmm. women is really being addressed. Yeah, okay, great. So if we think about nitrogen fixation and the benefits of legumes, then many people think immediately of, of green manures and of agroforestry and not of grain legumes. So, so why do we focus on grain legumes and not on these other uh, soil improving crops? Um, you know, I always say that whatever you do, you look at the end user. Mm -hmm. So the end user for us is that smallholder farmer who has a choice, not us. For us as scientists, we have a choice of saying, let's focus on the soil. But I quite remember a colleague introduced one of these cover crops in a location and tried to like tell the farmers that, look, this crop, if you grow it, will really help with soil fertility. The farmer in response said, we are not as rich as you are. We cannot put our energies into growing crop that we cannot eat. So at the end of the day, it's about weighing the benefits of yeah. those green manure, agroforestry, agrees the, the green legumes. So one of the key things that, or the benefits that the green legume adds is food, yeah, sure. for which the others don't provide. Yeah. Again, the income. So that smallholder farmer will think of, okay, the green legume will fix the same nitrogen as the green manure, as the agroforestry, again, I have food, I have nutrition. If I cannot afford any other protein source, I eat soya bean and I'm okay. So mm. it's about the choice of that farmer and not us. Yeah. Yeah. And I must say that, you know, I've worked myself on, on green manures and agroforestry yeah. in many, many different countries. And when it comes to the uptake by farmers, you see that farmers uh, really need something now. They, they exactly. Don't have this it's time about to food wait. security. It's yeah. not really, up. for them, it's not really about you and your soil. Yeah. The soil can wait. For them, it's yeah. about, so one, yeah. somebody said, into Africa is soil and stomach fertility. So stomach fertility. I haven't heard that one before. Good. Yeah, nice. So do you think fertilizer should be used and should fertilizer be part of sustainable intensification in Africa? One of the reasons why I picked up this job, really, I have been working so far in only development organizations. So making sure that you pick what is there and you run with it. But this aspect really has a research. And when I came at first, again, one of the things was really pushing fertilizer to be used on legumes. I was like, really? And I thought this thing fixes nitrogen. So what exactly are we communicating to the farmers? Mm. But later I realized that that soil is not only about nitrogen, it's also about other nutrients that needs to be there. So what are these nutrients? And one of them that I have learned being <laughs> mentored is yeah. let's say P, the phosphorus. So is it there in that depleted soil? And if it's there and you add only the nitrogen, would it work? And throughout the research of the project, we've seen that there are areas you can put as much as nitrogen, there wouldn't be anything. In areas you put as much as that phosphorus, there wouldn't be anything. So a combination really in over, I think 70% of all the researchers I've seen is really working. So for me, looking at the depletion rate of our soils in Africa, I really think that yes, fertilizer should be used, but again, what is that rate? Yeah, yeah. And sure. what time are we going to apply it? Yeah. It's very key for that smallholder farmer. We always say that the resources, but for me, if you don't have it, it's just like a medicine. Yeah. You don't take half medicine, you take the full. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. No, that's really clear. And I mean, yeah. uh, interestingly, this morning we've been in yeah. a discussion today already with. NORAD, we're in the, the Norwegian uh, Development Agency this morning on a, a big debate around uh, using fertilizers yeah. in Africa, because I think there are still very much among the development community, there are still people who feel that, that that's uh, something that we shouldn't be promoting. Yeah. And I think we all agree that, that it's necessary, but we need to make sure it's yeah. used well and, and, and efficiently. Everything. So if you go back to, to enter Africa directly, can you, can you say to me what you think really some of the highlights of the project have been over the past, well, it's nearly 10 years now that Enter Africa has been working? Um, 
one of the key things for me, my take home has always been just a list. And people wonder why just a list. If I go to a district as a Ghanaian in Northern Ghana, and I can boldly say that these are the varieties that if you grow, not I think, yeah. not maybe, but yeah, if yeah. you grow with this combination of other inputs, we do well and can give you this level of income and that level of production. I think for me, it is very key that the project across the 11 countries have been able to document what are the package of legume technologies that should or would be applicable for any of the smallholder farmers per location, I think is very critical. Um, again, one of the key things is this fertilizer issue, where when we started with partnerships, it wasn't only me who was a bit confused with the use of fertilizers, it actually. Some partners were thinking, actually with leggings, and also on maize, so what are we talking about? Different fertilizers on the same land. But now you see the number of partners across 11 countries who are integrating these packages into other projects that mm, are not sure. even into Africa. Okay, yeah. For me, these are two key highlights that even when you leave the project, any government can even pick it up and run with such packages. Mm. Well, that's great. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, you're particularly responsible for what we call MLE, yeah? Monitoring, Learning and Evaluation. So what are the main outcomes for farmers that in terms of not, not what we're pushing, but what you've seen, in fact, from the farmer's side in terms of what they've been taking up or outcomes or impacts? Uh, sure. you, you can maybe any, tell, any us the <laughs> tell us the difference. But, yes. Yeah. Yes, actually, you monitoring, evaluation, learning, or monitoring, learning, evaluation, yeah. depending on where you want to learn. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. good. Um, for me, it has been amazing seeing sometimes the smallholder farmers on the field. One of the key things, the outcomes, is just the confidence of smallholder farmers to say, this is what we want, and they see it. So before we started, you go to northern Ghana and let's say granite is already dead. Dead means the varieties are not what farmers are accepting, the yield levels are very low. So you introduce a number of varieties and then farmers are saying, well, you can tell us all of these things have good yield, but for us, we need one for our own consumption, we need one for market and these are the market treats. So if you can really help us to get that one that confidence of a smallholder farmer being able to say this is what i want and we follow suit to get them that is something that i think we shouldn't rule it out it's mm. a confidence level that mm -hmm. i think when you go to the field and you see them it's it's uh, very different from other way of introducing technologies to them then the other so can thing i just ask so that in the terminology would be an outcome somebody's learning exactly okay. it's an outcome being aware of that sure. technology and building up the confidence yeah, so sure. making use of that awareness yeah, yeah. yes okay. um then the other thing is being able to take that or technologies the legume technologies up into their cropping systems mm -hmm. so initially some of them did not know Mm -hmm. at all. In some locations, in some of the countries, they did not know about even the legumes would do well in their farming systems. But being introduced through demonstrations and then knowing that, okay, these things after all will not kill my maize, will not kill my cassava, it's actually going to add to the soil and I'm going to eat out of it. So that alone is helping them in terms of nutrition. Some of them are able to sell this. If maize fails, Mm -hmm. or maize prices are down, fortunately for them, it rotates sometimes. Mm -hmm. So again, they can get income from these legumes. Mm -hmm. And that is another outcome that I see. At the household level, um, we did a bit of a survey again with another project. Um, was it in Tanzania? Yes. And then you realize that meat consumption, for instance, was very low. Mm -hmm. But then you realize that beans consumption was very high. Mm. And then you ask the farmer the follow-up question. Since you are consuming more of beans, though they haven't done any scientific study, 
but the former response to say, ah, you people said beans has more protein. <laughs> so <laughs> since it's coming from my farm, yeah, yeah. I better eat it yeah, yeah. and save the money I used to buy the meat. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's a huge outcome for them that that protein, that income cannot be used for something else and the same protein can be yeah, obtained sure. from even okay. their farm. Yeah. So, so what about impacts? I mean, could we really say, are we ready? to say that enter Africa has really had impact in the different countries? Uh, sure. You know, I always define my impact based on that technology uh -huh. and how long it will take. Yeah. So if you introduce, some people say maize varieties took a long time for people to adopt. So they will say after five years or 10 years, we can assess impact. For me, I look at the kind of farmers we have, the kind of the dissemination that we do, and the kind of uptake that they are doing. Um, if a farmer grows legumes for three seasons, for instance, and if you are looking at impact in terms of productivity or in terms of income, can you be bold enough to say that this man or this woman has gone through three seasons mm. using these technologies, and therefore I'll be able to say that he or she started from here, and within three yeah, years, sure. the person has been able to increase maybe income or nutrition. So for me, it's about defining that impact and looking at that technology and how far. Yeah. yeah. And so how many farmers did, did enter Africa reach in the past few years? Uh, you know, when people ask these questions, I always say, ha, huh, because per what I do, my daily food, is to look at through all these partnerships and we have over 100 partnerships yeah, yeah, sure. around across the 11 countries so what we have that i can provide data that they are not as some people will say ghosts yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> so these are rare people who have participated in demonstrations field days um they are over 600,000 mm. or 650,000 and this excludes farmers who are rich through radio broadcast yeah, sure. who are reached through tv and again some of the partners even integrate these technologies in other projects which we call indirect reach yeah, yeah, all sure. these are excluding them sure. so really i think we should be able to say we have gone beyond a million yeah, okay <laughs> no nice really nice so turning back to yourself yeah. on a personal basis. What, what what do you take away from the experience of working with Africa and to Africa yourself in terms of your own your own learnings, let's say? Uh, probably I should have listed them <laughs> because there's more Maybe than Maybe just two. one or two. <laughs> <laughs> more than two pages. <laughs> no? No. Sure. Um, being able to take research out of the box mm. and making use of it is what I see in Into Africa. Mm -hmm. for personal basis. Um, at first, when I joined ITA, what I said was, I didn't even know about this organization. And I think the number of publications is more than the people who know about this institute. <laughs> that was the initial comment. Going through into Africa, which has about even 80% of our leaders, country coordinators, being either agronomists, rhizobiologists, but the passion of people making sure that that research is delivered in a way that people understand and take it up. So the link between research and development mm. is very well. It's okay. Sorry, the screen just went. Yeah. Is very well outlined yeah. within Into Africa. And personally, I'm not that deep researcher or scientist, but I really love it because yeah. of the link between what the research is doing, what the finding is, and what is being implemented on the yeah. ground. No, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. And I think you bring across some of the passion that we see, <laughs> we see from people in the project. So we're going to go over to some of the questions very soon, yeah. but maybe just before we do that, what what advice would you have for other people who might embark on a similar initiative of a, a development project of you know or are, are planning to go and start to work in different areas around sustainable intensification with smallholders do you have any key advice you'd like to give um what i always say is initiatives are not about ourselves Mm -hmm. The initiatives are always about an end user who is somewhere and most of the times called 
depending on the sector, if it's agreed, the smallholder farmer has always been about 90 percent mm. around which we decide within those initiatives. So what are those key preferences of those smallholder farmers is very key to consider, mm. else there will be no uptake. Mm. If I don't want to eat that beans, don't bring it because I will not eat it because we are just saying it's nice. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah. Yes. For me, the other thing is about coordination. We have always want to raise our individual flags, but at the end of the day, you ask yourself, if 10 different people come to me with the same medicine and claim that it works the same way, which one would I choose? <laughs> would it be okay that these 10 people coordinate and come to me with something reasonable? for me to have at least some limited option yeah. to choose from. So for me, these are two key things yeah. that I always will want initiatives to look at. Yeah. So the first one then is very much asking the farmer, asking the the, the, the person you're, you're working with, articulating demand, exactly. making that clear. Demand driven. Sure. Yeah. And I think the other one, like you say, is sometimes these can be very crowded spaces with many different types of organizations and making sure that we're not standing in each other's way and things and working very much together. Are they yet confusing the farmer? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so I think we'll go over now to some uh, questions from the course participants. I mean, maybe just before I do that, I just need to say that we have to rush off to another seminar, uh, which is on the hour at the end. So we need to leave about 10 minutes before the end of, of this session. But let's see, first of all, um, a question from India. So, if in extreme weather conditions, legume production isn't possible, then what's the alternative? Wow, it's a bit, bit of a difficult one. We work in some pretty dry areas at sure. times. Sure, um, across the 11 countries. And as I initially said, it has always been that end user. So what is that alternative mm. that we have there? And how do we evaluate it? And what is the support needed mm. to be able to do that? Uh, I'm not sure of these extreme weather conditions, but mm. for me, I take, for instance, the 11 countries, let's say weather conditions have never been the same across yeah, these sure. locations. So what you have to do then, or what we have been doing is you pick up that system and you evaluate what will go in there. Mm. What will that weather be able to support? Again, with that um, um, evaluation by that end user, who is that smallholder farmer? Mm. So what is that option? Um, I'm not sure if something like Uganda will apply where we try to combine uh, several crops, mm. like looking at the mountains, looking at the lower uh, areas, and then what is feasible. Mm. So in some areas, if you want to do, for instance, intercropping, there are different crops that can be considered, not necessarily the legumes alone. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah and I think particularly uh, of all of our legumes, cowpea yeah. is the one that does best under the driest yeah. conditions, yeah. and it's really pretty good in extreme conditions. So a question from Marcel uh, Barbier. Uh, and the question is, you mentioned that inclusion of fer mineral fertilizer will help farmers in Africa. Does this include micronutrients, boron and zinc? Do you want me to take that one? Or sure, <laughs> sure. As a social scientist, I'm being mentored. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, in fact, Teresa knows this very well. But, but we've we found in Africa generally, um, the, I mean, the, the major nutrients, of course, in nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium are, are, are particularly important. But we find increasingly in these old weathered soils, we find problems of um, deficiencies of other micronutrients like boron and zinc. Um, particularly in West Africa, boron's been uh, uh, included in all of the cotton fertilizers now for probably 40 or 50 years. Um, but increasingly, we're looking at blends of fertilizer, which are, uh, which are multi-nutrient blends, which include a whole range of um, different nutrients, uh, as well as just the standard sort of NPK. Maybe maybe on that topic, um, I mean, we're, we're here as well, uh, particularly for an initiative on sustainable soil. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to kick off, but maybe you could just talk a bit about why we're here around sustainable soil and what that meant, if like, I mean, the Ministry of Agriculture's uh, request to us. Yeah. So, um 
Ministry of Agriculture in Ghana is looking at promoting soya bean. Actually, they are considering even integrating other legumes uh, into that program. And looking at the work that Into Africa is doing, there has been a request to support the ministry to go into uh, soya production at country level. Um, initially, if you look at Ghana, we did not have specific fertilizer, for instance, for legumes. One of the key things that we did as a project was to bring in Yara, Yara Fertilizer Company, and then we did an evaluation of all these fertilizers. If you pick a fertilizer like TSP, for instance, it showed a very good results in terms of increasing the yield. However, there were still some nutrients that were needed. So we went into uh, some trials and then the company now is producing a new blend which had other components or other nutrients. Um, and this has been accepted at the country level and we are trying to see if we can go into bigger scaling. Yeah. Yep. So I think the, the nice example there is, and it relates very much to this question from Marcel, is that we recognize that triple superphosphate, TSP, yeah. which is only providing a little calcium, but mainly phosphorus, yeah. that that wasn't doing the trick on its own. It went back into research to identify these other nutrient yeah. needs. And then from those nutrient needs together, we could get the company to actually develop a new blend and put it on the market and governments there helping to promote yeah. it. So we're talking about soya bean yeah, in Africa. Now, globally, soya bean has a pretty bad name. Yeah? So, you know, as, as, a, as a crop that causes deforestation and, and all these things, that isn't a problem in Africa? In terms of soya bean causing sure. across the 11 countries, nowhere. No. Yeah, nowhere that I have seen that farmers will really go into deforestation because of soya bean. One of the interesting things I've seen, for instance, in Tanzania, is that farmers are more interested to do intercropping. Yeah. So, also they know about the benefits, they go through the process, the dissemination approach, the demonstration. So really, they have that small piece of land and they're already growing something on it. And they feel that if we integrate the soya into it, one, we will regain that soil fertility. Yeah. Cutting forests for legumes really we do not see it no. and have not seen it. So I think that's right. So and where we're seeing soybean expanding, it's expanding into areas uh, where they're already intensive yes. cropping. It yes. tends to be replacing yes. more of the cereal crops. And so it's really adding more diversity, I think, into the farming system. This links then to this question, and I, I heard about this one before it was coming up, that we were talking about um, whether or not crop diversity can increase production or or would tend to decrease production that the crop diversity would be greater under monoculture than under uh, polyculture mixed culture do you, do you want to comment on that because i've certainly got some ideas but anyway um just a quick one anyway. sure maybe it will help for me it depends on how that diversification and which crops you are considering so Per the examples that we have or what we have been doing so far, if we look at some of the results, for instance, trying to look at maize, soya bean, growing that maize or growing that soya bean, maybe a season shifting to maize, we have always, and even with the plant populations or densities, mm -hmm. in I think two countries, Kenya, Tanzania, where I know these results, they always end up increasing. Sure. the yield and even for various varieties of soya bean and maize they all give increases in the yield mm. um it all depends on which crops yeah, are sure. involved and how yeah that absolutely is, yeah yeah because i mean I, I know from my own experience and we've worked on uh, legume cereal intercropping or legume cassava intercropping in many different countries and in those um areas we, we talk about this idea and and those of you who go into the science more look at this land equivalent ratio and that's basically whether or not you would need uh, more land for the same yield if you grow crops combined or grow them separately 
nearly always when we look at cereal legume intercrops, we get uh, a land equivalent ratio above one, which means that, that there's a yield benefit of having the crops mixed. Now, I would say though, one caveat is that if we go for a very heavily fertilized cereal crop where you get a very big yield, then that, that is crowding out all the space yeah. and you see that there's no space underneath for a legume. So intercropping tends to go well at, at low, moderate fertility levels, but as soon as you get to very high yeah. production levels, high fertility levels, then you tend to crowd out the other legume. So we're on to some other questions here that seem to be triggered around this. Um, so a comment, I think, from uh, Patrick, as an agronomist at the University of Leeds who's saying that um, they're finding that complex lays, so a lay is a, is a, an, a rotation with grassland and, and crops, um, and they're using mixtures of up to a dozen legumes and, and grasses, which are providing both high quality forage and improving soil quality. I think one of the interesting things there, and I was discussing this with uh, Teresa earlier, was um, that those different legumes in that mixed uh, lay are probably providing slightly different functions. Yeah, they'll, they'll be legumes if they're mixing well with the grasses. And in the same way, the reason that we have smallholders producing a whole array of different crops is obviously because they have different uses, yeah? They are. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So it's not necessarily always about production. No, no, it's no. also about the, the goal. Um, so do we see the similar effects of diversity as the grass clover lays in, in Ento Africa? We, we've actually had, uh, I think, the work of Michael uh, Kerma, if yeah. we go back to northern Ghana, yeah. who's also shown um, some very nice results with different mixtures of uh, uh, maize and the different legumes, how they, they do well in different intercrops. And also looking at different um, spatial arrangements of planting, mm -hmm whether you're planting in the same row or alternate rows or wider uh, strips or, but tending to find that the ones where we're keeping the cereal populations high and adding the legume in, so what we call additive design, mm -hmm. so the ones that farmers tend to like and that tend to give the most uh, yield. Now there's a question specifically for Teresa. For your experience in Northern Ghana, have have legumes played a vital role in intensification, in sustainable intensification, considering the weather conditions? And this is from Hamdan Issa. So maybe is that somebody from Ghana? Is that a Ghanaian name? You don't Issa, know. Issa sounds. <laughs> sounds it could be. Yes. But anyway. Yeah. So considering weather conditions in northern Ghana. Sure. Um, as I initially said, we do what we do in into Africa really is to look at that end user and the location, which is very critical. So if you go to Northern region or Northern Ghana currently, you have different locations with different varieties, with different packages of legumes that will do well. And I was just looking at a data that was given from across the three regions. And we can see that there are some of the varieties which are even gaining a yield of around 2.4 tons per hectare, which initially we were having around 900, 800 um, um, kg yeah, yeah, yes, sure. per hectare. Double, yeah. So for me, we have been able to get, no matter the weather condition across the three northern regions, been able to get packages that are good. In terms of that uh, sustainable intensification, I know that in northern Ghana and per a recent study we've done, the consumption of granite. Granite is not on a higher production at the moment, not so huge like soya bean, but that consumption at household level, cowpea is very great. Soya bean initially was 100% cash, mm -hmm. but currently is also being consumed mm -hmm. at the household level. And people just growing maize, for instance, now you see them trying to integrate. Mm -hmm. also these uh, legumes, which again comes back to be able to maintain the soil fertility. So for me, uh, we have even gone beyond the weather conditions in northern Ghana. So each weather situation 
within yeah, Northern yeah, Ghana, yeah. you should be able to have yeah. what will be working in that location. Yeah. Because I remember even down to the level of uh, soybean varieties, if you in Northern, what we call Northern Ghana in the, the center around Tamale, yeah. those areas. Yeah. And if you go to Upper, upper east, east, which is much drier, that we yes. have to have different varieties. We actually have different, different varieties. So now we areas. have yeah. varieties that can go with short rains. Yeah, short and we have season. varieties, yeah. yes, and then for the longer rains or for longer seasons. Yeah. 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 So for weather conditions, I think we have been able to manage yeah. that one. Yeah. I, I was just thinking then about the. Um, before we go on to an, another question here. You know, we, we're talking about these different legumes, and you said a couple of things that that, that triggered thoughts for me earlier. One, one was this about groundnut really dying out in the north of Ghana and now picking up again. And yeah. maybe you could tell us something about that. And then I'd like to ask you another thing about soy. Yes. So before the project started, or when we went in there, you know, the first thing is you do an evaluation of what is there and why farmers are mm -hmm. not picking it up and what are the challenges. So basically, there were some varieties, and apparently there's one called Chinese, mm. an indigenous variety, indigenous yeah, good Chinese. Yeah. So okay. that was the main thing yeah. being grown. But if you look at that granules, um, I'm sure in one meeting, one was served, and I asked myself. How much land area would I need to harvest and to get just 10, 10 kg or 100 kg that bag? Mm. And even that color was not appealing. So farmers mm. had so many criteria of saying, look, these are the reasons. And if you can help us, mm. we will be able to take it up. So actual land area for granite production was almost nil. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the project now came in looking at the criteria by farmers what is exactly mm -hmm. needed brought in varieties to be evaluated and this was actually an evaluation of farmers going through the process of mm -hmm. two seasons and yeah. saying that you have provided us with four varieties we think we want to go with two and for the two one will be for household consumption the other one we have seen this niche market mm -hmm. which needs it and we think if you can help us with it yeah. so the project had to come in with how do we make the seeds available yeah for the yeah, farmers yeah, to be yeah. able to grow it so for me it's always about what i said that research but how do you pick it what is that strategy to pick sure. it up yeah, to make yeah, it yeah. work for that small sure. farmer? Yeah. And I know these are the varieties that have been successful, the ones that we brought in from northern Nigeria. From northern Nigeria. Uh, large seeded, yeah. high oil content, yeah. very, very good, a good disease resistance. Yeah. yeah. So, so the other one was, was this one on soybean, because I think, you know, you're saying that soybeans mainly for cash. So maybe you could just explain a bit about the, the cash demand, sorry, the cash market for soybean and why soybean is, is a good cash crop. Um, in Africa in, in terms of national demand mm -hmm. and what's happening in the dynamics there? Mm. Uh, you know, processing soybean has really not been, or before we came in, was really not, not even up to 30%. Mm. So the few people who were producing soybean were actually producing with the hope that somebody will pick it up. So coming in with that nutritional aspect, yes, some people are doing it for household food integration. However, people still see cowpea granules as easily consumed. And then for soya bean, we have all these processing companies mm -hmm. for oil, mm -hmm. for feed, mm -hmm. fish, uh, for poultry. Yeah, yeah. So sure. for me, these are three key markets for soya bean. Uh, sometimes, or at a point in time, again, I'll go to Northern Ghana. We have also Tanzania, I have examples yeah, across yeah. years. But for Northern Ghana, for instance, at a point in time, there was so much soya bean, there was a disconnect between those buying and those producing, that is one. The disconnect mainly was coming from, do you meet the market quality, whatever. So addressing this a bit, Currently, you find out that yes, people are realizing farmers are able to produce that soya bean and we need it. Mm. So we come in to buy to address these three markets. I'm not sure whether what we are seeing now is really something good or not, but currently we have huge market from let's say Turkey and from China. Mm. And these markets are competing. Mm. 
yeah, with yeah. the domestic market. And that's particularly for GMO free, I think. GMO free, for, and, uh, yes. And for me, it's, and, yeah. it's all the soya mm. in, in northern Ghana is GMO free. So for me, my thinking has really been yes, it's a cash crop. Yes, we are looking for that market. But what is that objective of looking for that market? Mm. Do we want to also build? the local industries to sure. have that yeah. sustainable yeah. Sure. market or we just <clears throat> yeah. want cash for smallholder <clears throat> farmers for which i know after a year there will be that massive distortion and we might be back to rejuvenating the local yeah. processing so relying on these export markets with turkey or china is very risky because they could go somewhere else for me yeah. i'm really looking at a policy backing yeah sure to be able to resolve yeah. to say that yes we need market for soya yeah. bean but proportionately we think that some proportion should yeah. also go to the domestic yeah. market because well. I, I know that currently there's massive importation of soy cake particularly as animal feed mm -hmm. um from south america from argentina yeah. brazil and, and obviously that could be produced in africa and both mm -hmm. benefit the african farmer and actually reduce imports so so a national benefit in terms yeah. of import substitution um, there's a question actually from Marcel Barbier again, asking about what we could learn um, from soy in Brazil and, and, and what we could teach them in terms of deforested areas in Africa. I find that one a bit difficult because I think, um, you know, in, in Africa where soybeans being grown, as I was saying, it's really just going in as a replacement crop within existing farming systems. And obviously what happened in the past was this massive expansion of um, soybean in the Cerrado area. Mm. Uh, I know there's been this moratorium in Amazonas to stop soybean expanding into the Amazon area, but there's still been a lot of concern about land use change in the Cerrados. But the problem there is really one of, of generally of agricultural expansion. I'm not sure that it's necessarily just just soybean. So I think that the the conditions in Africa are very very different, and the, in a sense, the bad name that soybean yeah. has on that global level from from South America is something that we, we shouldn't translate to Africa. Uh, although I know that certainly in, in Argentina, in the Chacos area and these, these sort of fragile soils that soybeans still been expanding. So um, Marcel was also asking if there's collaboration between Brazil and African institutions. I know in, in Northern Ghana, there has yeah. been, yeah. So with uh, Embrapa and particularly yeah. around uh, Kalpi, I think, around on, Kalpi. on, yeah. on yes. inoculation, yeah. Um, so, Natalia Palacios asking about nutritional contents of grain legumes. Would you like to comment on that one? Um, you mentioned already the consumption of soya, I think. Yes, and, and usually people will want to know. So, as you apply, one of the things I even asked myself at, at first was with this nutritional content, when you apply fertilizer, mm -hmm. it has no implication on the, the nutritional content. We also do that, and I quite remember three years ago, we did sample of all the harvested or, or the yields of some varieties, three varieties in Nigeria in different locations mm -hmm. with application of SSP, for mm -hmm. instance, and uh, inoculant, and then to test the nutritional, whether it's the same or after the application of the inputs mm -hmm. whether the nutritional content changes and if i remember correctly i don't have the figures at hand but two of the varieties there was nothing mm -hmm. the, okay. the yes the protein content was intact and i think with that one i was personally convinced that we can still go ahead with all the inputs yeah, and you sure. can still retain yeah, yeah. the protein Good nutritional quality. yeah and i know working with other nutritionists that the legumes have benefits in terms of vitamins and uh, minerals yeah. and things yeah. it's not it's not just protein, but they're also the divers diversification in the yep. diet is is important. Yep. I think with an eye on the time, we're going to move towards the last question, and and this is rather a technical one from uh, Julian Camaleonte, um, talking about uh, the inf the influence of pH, yep. and uh, one of the, to increase uh, pH, we have to take care of the nitrogen type. I, I, I guess he's alluding to. The problem that you can get acidification with repeated use of ammonia over a very long time. Um, so, a question: Have we done any work on this? Have we found a way around the use of dolomite to increase pH? Um, it's a technical soil science question, so I maybe better take it. Um, 
I mean, obviously, dolomite as a source of lime is a mixture of calcium and magnesium carbonate. So it provides both calcium and magnesium, which are both important uh, cations crop growth, as well as having a, 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 a pH correction uh, benefit. I must say, luckily in Africa, we're not faced with huge problems of soil acidity. They tend to be localized for particular areas. And in, main, in the main, liming is really hardly used uh, in, in African conditions um, because the soils, uh, the crops are basically reasonably tolerant of, of acidity and there, there isn't a huge problem of, of aluminium. But we often do need to, in fact, use uh, some... Uh, dolomite to provide the calcium and magnesium rather than to create p to correct ph because of the soils being deficient in those nutrients but there are some initiatives currently going on because as as agriculture intensifies and moves forward there are areas with uh, with problems with soil ph and i think particularly in tanzania there's quite an uh, uh, an initiative in the southern highlands the Alinga area going down to umbea uh, thinking about needing to uh, to look at uh, liming in the future. I don't know if there are any final I, I words think, you'd I like to for, leave us with. I think for liming also we've done something in Uganda okay. where it seemed to be very useful in mm. adding it to the other nutrients. Uh, however, the challenge as he's saying is adding the cost because yeah. we did the, the economic benefits yeah of combining all of that and it seems a bit on the higher side yeah. so now the question is even if it's useful yeah. how beneficial sure. would it be to the small because it's a bulky a bulky exactly. material and, and yeah. the, the transport and even how to make it to that hard. available yeah. has been only the challenge yeah. yeah so any last comments you'd like to make any last things you'd like to yes, say to our, um, uh, our course participants yes it's been amazing working on into africa looking at the effects looking at the gains from legumes for smallholder farmers amazingly looking at research as being so passionate <laughs> to take nice, research yeah. products to make sure that it works at a smallholder farmer level and also having a clear research based on demand yeah sure. so what is yeah. that gap that the smallholder yeah. farmer yeah. needs and how are we addressing it uh, for me, that is key for research. Yeah, so sure. I will encourage all researchers to really do research based on addressing a need and a gap yeah, to sure. make sure that yeah. that resource is used. Yeah. Now, a very nice point yeah. to end on. I think that that idea that this idea of sort of pure research and applied research, yeah. we should drop that. Exactly. We should work on important problems and we can do the most important and fundamental sure. research around those. Thanks very much indeed for your time uh, today, Therese. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed the, the session today and uh, good luck with the course and uh, stick at it, guys. We're... Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, goodbye and thanks for the discussion. <laughs>